Daniel chapter 9. Y'all flip back there. Take a left turn. Go back to the left side of the Bible. Speaking of the 60s, welcome to, to the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel chapter 9. Don't y'all just love my humor? <laughs> Daniel chapter 9. Okay. Uh, Daniel chapter 9. Let's start reading in verse 24. Seventy weeks. We know now that's 490 years. Okay, because a week here is a period of seven years. So, seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again uh, and the wall even in troublous times. Okay. Before the break, we saw that the tribulation on earth is a part of God's prophetic program, okay? Um, which, again, the church today, the body of Christ, is not a part of because we are a part of the mystery program, not the prophetic program. If you want to think of it this way, the mystery program is really a subset of the prophetic program. And the reason why is because of what Paul tells us in Romans 11. God is currently in the process of using us, the church, the body of Christ today, Gentiles, primarily Gentile church, to move Israel, if you will, to move them to je jealousy, okay, so that they will turn back to him, all right? So in that sense, we're kind of a subplot, if you will, okay? And we also looked at the math, the crazy math here um, of the prophecy and saw that the tribulation, again, will be seven years. That's how you know. If somebody says, well, how do you know the tribulation is going to be seven years? You say, well, you've got to have a Ph.D. in Daniel chapter 9. Simple. You know, and then they're probably not going to say anything. Because they're going to think you've got a Ph.D. in Daniel chapter 9. You do now, Karen. You're the <laughs> smartest woman on earth now. Um, and so we looked at that. Now, once that seven years starts right out here, the seven-year period of tribulation, okay? Once it starts, as we saw last week, the whole earth, the whole earth is going to go through some pretty, pretty dark stuff. Now, here is my question. Trevor, you got this. You feeling confident? I'm always confident. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Often wrong, but always confident. Well, you've been confidently wrong. You know, I mean, that's good. All right. What will be the starting point of the tribulation? Now, here's the thing. We really need to nail this. Because if something happens and we see this thing happen, then we know we've got it all wrong. So this is important, right? <laughs> Karen, you want to take a stab at any idea what's going to start the tribulation period? She says the rapture. That's your guess. <laughs> Thought you knew. <laughs> Lydia says the rapture. Any other takers here? See, now, I tell you, I haven't been reading the Bible. <laughs> no. Hey, here's the thing. I promise you, if I polled a thousand Christians out there right now, nearly a thousand would say the rapture. Okay? Think about this, though. Is the rapture a part of the prophetic scriptures that talk about the tribulation? No. So just from a logical standpoint, can the rapture be the start of the tribulation? No. If it were Satan's going to claim to be the Lord and... No. Right here. Be where he's last You're the closest. Okay, Jonathan says the rise of the Antichrist. Okay. The problem with that is a rise is not a moment, right? That Antichrist actually may be out there rising right now. He may have just been born. I don't know. Okay? So we still don't know. Now, here's what we're going to explore first is what in the world is going to initiate the seven-year tribulation on planet Earth. Very, very important. Crucial information here. So you're in Daniel chapter 9. Let's come down to verse 26. Read carefully. Okay? 
And after three score and two weeks, so after, after this block of the, our segment of the 490 years, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Now watch this. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the word desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now remember, a week here is a period of seven years. So for one seven-year period, okay, what does it say there? He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, and then we go forward from there. We're going to stop there for a second, though. So let me kind of cut to the chase here, and we're going to dig down into this, and I'll explain. At the start of, or the, the starting point, or the thing that is suddenly going to trigger all of this cataclysmic stuff, there is going to be a signing of a seven year covenant between Israel. Notice it says between many, uh, uh, with many. In the Hebrew here, it's literally with the many. Technically speaking, this is going to be like Israel's politicians. They're diplomats, if you want to call it that, okay? There is going to be a signing of a seven-year covenant between Israel and the, well, according to this, the prince that shall come. Now notice prince there in verse 26 is not capitalized. So that is not referring to whom? Jesus. That prince is the prince of the power of the air, okay? Or is at least animated by this prince. This is a whole different person Jonathan, you alluded to it, the Antichrist. So by this point, the Antichrist will have risen to prominence, risen in the ranks and power, enough now where he can make a promise to the nation Israel and manipulate them to the point they are willing to sign a seven-year agreement, a seven-year covenant. Okay? Y'all with me? That is the start of the seven-year tribulation on earth. Okay? And so... Now, one of the things that we find out, so hold your place there in Daniel 9. Go back to 1 Thessalonians 5 real quick. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's apparent from Scripture that this covenant, part of the terms of the covenant is that the Antichrist is going to promise peace and safety for Israel. Y'all think about Israel in your lifetime. They make the headlines all the time. I'm not sure it's ever good. At least from a geopolitical standpoint. It, it is like they are always right smack dab in the crosshairs of somebody either wanting their territory, wanting their intellectual property, wanting something, and just wanting really to obliterate them. Right now, there's all this pressure from the, the Palestinians wanting to have sort of this dual government. And then you've got the Muslims who are taking over the Temple Mount. I mean, there's, it has been just historically a dumpster fire, right? I mean, it's been wild. And so this Antichrist is going to come along and apparently promise peace and safety. That's what Paul tells us. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2. Paul says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night... For when they, okay, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh up upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Okay, so what's going to happen is suddenly they're going to let their guard down. They are going to think, oh, we finally have peace and safety. In fact, this is what I think is going to happen. I think they're literally going to assume this person to be the Messiah. I'm leaning towards believing more and more that this guy will actually be Jewish. Okay? Um, and so they're going to look to him as a Messiah. By the way, he will have the keys to the temple. Okay? We'll talk about that here a little more in, in a little bit. But... Um, 
But we do know um, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, obviously, leading up. Remember, Jesus talked about that, wars and rumors of wars and all this stuff. That's still true today. I mean, there's still wars and rumors of wars and nation rising up against nation, kingdom against kingdom and all that stuff. So my guess is that by the time we get past the rapture, by the way, that is going to really make earth weird for I don't know how long. But when suddenly children are gone instantly, and every true Christian on earth is instantly gone, I'm, I'm thinking the headlines on the news that night and, and the messages coming from the pulpits on Sundays are going to be something to the effect of, what in the world is going on? Okay? My guess is it's going to be at least significant enough where economies will make a shift you're going to have things get in an upset, upset state. Along with the fact that Satan's already moving and shaking and trying to, you know, jockey for position and all these different things. To the point Israel, little old Israel, stuck in the middle of all this, is going to be begging and hoping for some kind of security. And guess who's going to come along? The anti-Christ. And from everything we can see from scriptures and what has happened in the past in Israel's history, uh, they can be gullible, I guess you could say, just like we can be. And so he's going to come along and promise them all kinds of stuff that he cannot honor his word, doesn't really care to honor his word. Now, last week we looked at the first half of the tribulation. Now, half of seven is three and a half years. Okay, so last week we looked at the, the first three and a half years of the tribulation using Matthew chapter 24 sort of as our guide. Now, remember that God will unleash a series of judgments over the earth. The first seven judgments that he's going to unleash are what we call the seal judgments. Remember, there's going to be a scroll. Jesus himself will break a seal. When he breaks a seal, that scroll will unroll, and when it does, it will unleash God's judgments on the earth. So with every seal, there's a new judgment on the earth. Then the second set are what we call the trumpet judgments. Literally, angels will sound a trumpet, and when that happens, it's not going to be a pretty sound. People aren't going to be like, oh, yes, we're on the fifth trumpet. It's not going to be a party sound, okay? Not going to be that at all. Now, there is another significant marker that happens during the tribulation period. Now, Cotton, you started to sort of touch on this a little bit. But another significant marker that happens during the tribulation that I want us to look at now. Keep your marker there in Daniel 9, because we'll come back to it. But go back with me on Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And remember, Matthew chapter 24, this is what we call the Olivet Discourse. Jesus is literally on the Mount of Olives. He's talking to the disciples. He's explaining to them end time stuff, okay? And up until verse 15, we've gotten a lot of first half of the, the story information about the tribulation. And then we come to verse 15, okay? Verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand... Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Jesus is saying, listen, I don't care if you're naked. When this thing, which is known as the abomination that causes desolation, happens, you get out of there. Run naked. Do not worry about anything else. Go. If you're hobbling on one foot, don't go back and get your crutches. Take off. Hobble. Hop. Crawl. Get out of there. Okay? Go to the mountains. And verse 19, And woe unto them uh, that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation. So now we're talking second half. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now think about this. Great tribulation is going to happen in the second half, and it is going to be unlike 
any time in history, including the first three and a half years. Now remember, in that first three and a half years, billions of people are wiped off the face of the earth. Millions of acres of trees and vegetation gone. Fresh water made bitter. Sun turning dark and, and stars going out. I, it's, it's insane. And now we hit the Great Tribulation. We're going to get another series of judgments. But what is the marker that's going to initiate that last half? Well, what does he say in verse 15? The thing that Daniel talks about, which is the abomination that causes desolation. So turn back now with me to Daniel chapter 9, and let's look at this thing. Uh, verse 27, and let's read it. It says, And he, that is the prince that shall come, we know that to be the Antichrist, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, now remember, week period of seven years. So in the middle of the seven year period, so at the three and a half year mark, it says here, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So at the midpoint, Antichrist is really going to light the fuse. He's going to do something that is so egregious, so upsetting to God, that it's like, uh, no, you just pushed the wrong button, dude. You have. You, you, it, it's over. And so that is the true midpoint is when Antichrist declares himself to be something that he is not. Now, one of the things you've got to understand, this person known as the Antichrist, everything he does, thinks, and says is animated by Satan. In fact, he is going to escape death, but again, animated by Satan. And this is all so that he can set himself up as God and try to convince people, look, I've even cheated death. Don't you know I'm the Messiah? And that is the thing that is going to so upset God. Here's how I know that. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. In this section of Revelation, there's some, there's some symbols that you just you need to understand, and I'm going to sort of be your tour guide on this and just kind of cut to the chase on this and help you understand it. It'll help you make sense of it. In Revelation 13, um, you get these different characters. And so let's start in verse 1. It says here, and uh, this is John the Revelator. He's receiving this vision, and he says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea. Now here, the sea is symbolic of... Of the oceans of people on planet earth. Okay. And he says here. And I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Okay. So in other words. This is a human being that is going to rise to prominence. Out of the population of humanity. Okay. Now the reason why I know this, these are symbols. Is because elsewhere in scripture. It, it interprets that for us. Okay. So this is not Greg making this up. I'm not some genius. Okay. It, it tells me that's what it is. So just understand. That's what it is. And then he goes on. This, this beast rising up out of sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power. The dragon here, if you go back and look, is Satan himself. Okay? He has now been cast to the earth. He is on the earth. And so he is able to animate the Antichrist, this human now, okay? And it says here, And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority, probably through intimidation. To be honest with you all, if a dragon showed up today and said, Hey, give me your spot. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's a real simple economy there. All right. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, 
Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. How many months is three and a half years? Seven. <laughs> yeah. Half so, tribulation. so three years is 36 months. Then a half a year is another six months. So 36 plus 6 is 42. Okay? So again, we're talking about the second half of the tribulation there. Verse 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saint. Okay? So, from the midpoint forward, okay, for 42 months, God is going to unleash another series of seven judgments on the earth because he has now been sort of prodded and poked. The Antichrist has done something, which is, by the way, he has set himself up as God in the temple. Now, um, let me come back to that here in just a second. Just understand that. What is going to happen, the judgments that now God is going to unleash are what we call the bowl judgments. Every time he pours out a bowl, he's pouring out wrath onto the earth. And again, this is great tribulation now. Okay? Y'all turn with me to Revelation 15. Yep. Before we read that, let me explain this real quick. So, and again, we just don't have time to get into all this. What the Antichrist is going to do at the halfway point, basically he's going to break his covenant with Israel because he doesn't care about them. He's in power now. He can do whatever he wants to. And so once he does that, he is going to enter into the temple and he is literally going to declare himself to be God. And he's going to point to all of his miraculous things, you know, coming back from death and all this stuff. Okay, so... He's going to set himself up as God. He's going to destroy all the sacred things, okay? And, and there he is to be worshipped. Now, the thing you've got to understand, that assumes there's going to be a temple in place. Right now, there's not. Okay? There will be a third temple built. Okay? The problem is, it is not sanctioned by God. It is not a godly thing. Okay? Okay? And so, it's just going to be an abomination altogether. Now, you can look it up online yourself. Today, right now, there is a movement among Jews to rebuild the temple. You can look it up. So, when I tell you this isn't just some far off thing, I am telling you now, get ready. <laughs> this is live. This isn't Bible story time anymore. This is live. It's real. It's getting serious, y'all. Okay? Just know that. <laughs> there, are, there are movements of Jews that are seeking to even do things as far as researching their family tree so they know which tribe they're from and all this because it's going to be important when we get out there. Okay? Uh, there are things where they have craftsmen rebuilding the, the ephod and, and, and all the garments for the high priest. Y'all, y'all it's there. It, it's, this is real life for real stuff happening. Okay, so this isn't make-believe anymore. It is legit. And so the, the groundwork is being laid for all these events that we see take place in Jerusalem out in the tribulation. Okay, so these bold judgments. Now, uh, Revelation chapter 15, let's begin reading in verse 1. And John writes, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, 
and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. This is a serious, serious scene now. And they sing the song, Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thy, uh, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I look, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. So the real one. <laughs> and the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, or bowls, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Let me, let me kind of take some creative license here. The smoke, this is, this is the rage of God now. This is him boiling over. This is it. The, the Hebrew text in the Old Testament is really interesting. It talks about God being long of snout. And that Hebrew expression, if you'll think about it, sometimes, I don't know if y'all, if your dad ever did this, when he's about to get on to you, and draws in that breath. Well, God is long of snout. He has been patient. And then now it's done. No more. You're not going to do this anymore. Smoke's filling the temple. He is about to unleash his fury. And so this is, boy, serious. Chapter 16, verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, and pour out the vials of wrath of God, of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. A noisome sore. I like the way the King James interprets this word. It doesn't just mean gross. It's bubbling. Maggots. Noisome. Gross. It's eating them alive. And guess what? They can't do a thing about it. They can't even die if they want to. Not letting it happen. It's time for his wrath. He gave him chances, didn't he? It goes on. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Animals too. Animals included. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. No more drinking water. Nothing to bathe in anymore except blood. You wanted blood? You get blood. I mean, this is some serious business. Can't go fishing. No food. You can't grow food. You don't have water to grow food. It's getting, it's getting bad now. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and must and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. God, you are just to do this. We, we've had our warnings. We've had our chances. <clears throat> Verse 8, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. So now you've got open wounds now that are being scorched with heat. You know, in some ways, it's a little bit of God's mercy. He's letting them stay on earth a little bit longer. He's cauterizing those wounds. It's not going to feel good, but it'll keep them from bleeding to death. Let them live just a little bit longer. Hold them up from that lake of fire just a little bit longer. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Verse 10, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. They're chewing their own tongues off. 
They can't, they can't do this. They can't cover it. They can't get rid of it. All they've got left to do is bite their tongues in pain. Okay, but look at verse 11. Is God not true and righteous and just to do this? Because what does he see in their heart? Verse 11, and blaspheme the, the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. That's God in his wisdom looking forward to how he is going to bring his people back to their promised land. Verse 13, and I saw uh, three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are uh, the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice uh, out of the temple of heaven from, from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great... And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, every hailstone about 114 pounds. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great that's what you call the fierceness of God's wrath go back with me now to Matthew chapter 24 and look with me at verse 22 Matthew chapter 24 verse 22 and Jesus says, in verse 22, And except those days should be shortened. In other words, he's determined in amount of time that this is going to take place. Okay? And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But, for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now, when he's talking about the elect here, guess what? He is not talking about us. You know how I know that? Because at the point Jesus spoke that, and the people that he was speaking to, the mystery given to the Apostle Paul, which establishes us, the body of Christ, was still hidden God. Nobody, nobody even knew or heard anything about that. So you're not in the picture. You are not that elect. You will not be going through that tribulation. Okay? But because God loves his people so much, which he has declared for centuries and centuries, he said, okay, it's going to be this long, and then it'll end. Okay? And so... He says there, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened because he loves his people. What's amazing about that to me is God has more in the tank to pour out, but he holds back. I'm sitting here thinking, like, what did he left? What is earth going to look like? We have, we have a 114 pound hailstone falling out of I mean, one of those hits this building from that distance, it is going to explode. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be an amazing force, you know. And so, uh, just the fact that God's power is, whoo, it's massive. Um, but, you know, God will not stay angry forever. Now, why won't he do that? Turn back with me to Romans 11. This is what we're going to close on. Romans chapter 11. And come with me to, to um, uh, we'll start in verse 30. He has promised Israel he's not going to annihilate them. That's, that's really the ultimate reason why, but there's even a bigger reason, okay, a bigger plan. Uh, Romans 11, verse 30, for as ye in times past, he's talking to Gentiles, for as ye Gentiles in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through Israel's unbelief. 
Even so, have these also now not believed, Israel's not believing today, that through your mercy, they also may obtain mercy. Okay? Verse 32, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. See, even through this tribulation thing, as, as dark and dismal it's going to look, God has an ultimate purpose to bring as many people in as he can. Whether it be through the prophetic program or the mystery program, he's trying to bring it all in. Okay? And he goes on, he says uh, in um, uh, verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him... And through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. All of it's for him. Every bit of it. You know, this whole process of judgment and, and just cleaning the slate ultimately is so that people will see his power and his glory and worship and glorify him because he alone is worthy. And he's trying to bring as many in as he can. Now, when we get out here into the future, in the eternal order, past the great white throne judgment in the eternal order, I do believe there's going to be some interaction between those who are saved under the prophetic program and the mystery program. Okay? And I will just say this maybe one time. We'll have to get into this again sometime. Heaven is not us floating around on clouds, playing harps, singing hymns all the time. Okay? It is far beyond that. It is so much cooler. Okay? And so just understand, God, it's obvious, I think, at this point, He's creative. And I think He's got it ready. And so all we've got to do right now is be looking for Him, looking ahead, being excited for that glorious future and that hope that we have. All right. Questions, thoughts, confusions. <laughs> a lot of questions there. All right, let's uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then uh, we'll be dismissed. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the chance to study your word today. Lord, as uh, serious and heavy as it is, God, ultimately we know that even the tribulation is uh, very much, to some degree, a reward for the saved who... We're so injured, so hurt, so abused uh, by the devil's efforts here on earth. Um, and to set the record straight of who you are and, and how powerful you are. Father, I, I long for and look forward to the day, Jesus, that we get to see you face to face. And to enter into a heavenly glorious place that we get to be a part of one day. That we are, as the body of Christ, members of, citizens of. Uh, Father, help us to look forward to that time and to be um, passionate about sharing the truth of your word with those around us as we have opportunity. Lord, please give us those opportunities that we might do that. Lord, we love you. And again, Jesus, we are beyond grateful uh, for your sacrifice, your death, burial, and resurrection. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Now, I know we don't look for...